When I was taught electrical machines many years ago, um, I was taught each type of machine separately as if it had uh, a unique existence. But of course, bearing in mind this was a long time ago, uh, the subject now has become so vast that to cover it on this basis uh, would be unsatisfactory. It is possible with some thought to see in electrical machines many common features. Indeed, the theories attempts to bring out certain points of similarity and uh, production of torque is one of them. And that's what we're going to consider today. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, which is the fifth in the series, you will be able to see that the mechanism of production of torque in DC uh, synchronous and induction machines is not really different. So we start, and as always, we we'll start with something simple. We have here a tube, and I cut just two slots, put two coil sides, applying the right hand rule, they will give this current in, current out will produce flux downwards. The flux pattern in this tube will be as shown. And we know the convention is if a surface emits flux lines, we call it North Pole. If a surface receives flux lines, we call it South Pole. So really what we have here is two pole arrangement, North and South as indicated. Now I have an inner member, I've just shaped it this way, and I have coils as indicated in red, applying the right hand roll, then we have flux going downwards. The full flux button will be as shown. Again, flux in, that will be south pole, flux out will be north pole. Next, I'll bring the two uh, structures together, i.e. I'll put the red magnetic field inside the blue magnetic field and see what happens. Now the direction of the two magnetic fields, the red and the blue, is the same. And what we have here, we have north and south. North and south will attract. The bottom north and south will also attract. So there will be attraction forces at both sides of the machine and the, radi the radial forces uh, if, this, if the rotor, uh, the inner member, is uh, perfectly centered, the forces, the radial forces will cancel each other, will be equal of magnitude and uh, opposite in direction, and the net force acting on the bearing will be zero. Now what's shown here is that the two magnetomotive force, FR and FS, I'm assuming that the outer tube is stationary, the inner one can move, can rotate, there, the both magnetomotive force are in the same direction and the forces generated will cancel each other. Now, I will displace the rotor by an angle. What happens here, we have this south pole that will be attracted towards the north, this north will be attracted toward the south, so there will be a force acting, trying to align the rotor back to the original position. And if we, this, this is tangential force. And if we look at, I took here just the magnetomotive forces, there is an angle delta between them. Uh, those of you who studied synchronous machines would recognize angle delta, we call it the load angle. Oh yes, it is the same load angle. But now I'm going to show you that DC and induction machines also have load angles. Anyway, there is an angle between the two magnetomotive forces. The tangential component will cause uh, force, will uh, produce force. And because there are two forces that are equal, that will produce torque. The tangential components will produce forces that cancel each other. So the force generated here is due to uh, to the red component of the magnetomotive force that is normal to the stator blue component. This force will continue to exist as long as there is an angle between the two magnetomotive forces. So all what I wanted to say in this slide is 
if the two magnetomotive forces are in line, i.e. there is no angle between them, then the force and the torque will be zero, that's torque. If there is an angle between them, as the case here, then a force and the torque will be produced. But this angle has to be preserved all the time and change the maximum uh, value of a sine occurs when delta is 90 degrees. So the maximum value of the force will occur when the angle delta is 90, delta maximum is 90 electrical degrees. So to summarize, in a rotating machine, for the force to exist while the machine is rotating, we must preserve the angular displacement between the two axes of the magnetizations. It's not essential to the concept that the, 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 the FR and the FS are stationary. They could be rotating. These two fields could be rotating, but there must be an angle between them for the force to exist. So torque will be developed as long as there is a current carrying conductor uh, system arranged it in, in a proper way in a magnetic field. Therefore, torque will be developed in a motor as electromechanical torque inside the motor. Take away the friction and the windage losses, the torque will be appearing at the shaft to drive the load. Also in generator, torque will be produced because we'll have current carrying conductors in magnetic fields. We have two MMFs with an angle between them. There will be a torque. But in this case, in case of a generator, the torque produced will be similar to that back EMF. You remember the back EMF in a motor? That torque will be a resisting force and torque against which the prime mover works and convert mechanical to electrical power. Now we consider the case of a DC machine. DC machine, conventional DC machine, would have a stator, which is excited with DC coils to produce magnetic flux. Then the rotor will have slots in which there are current uh, conductors supplied with current through brushes. This part here is the commutator. What is the commutator? It consists of segments which are insulated from each other. So this segment is insulated from the next segment and so on. So current goes to this segment, can go to anything that is connected to that segment, which is the brush if it's there, but it cannot go there. No, it cannot go there, cannot go there. So. Here is the, a photo a cutaway of a DC machine. You can see the field and the armature, the commutator, the shiny part here. The lines between the commutator segments is the mica insulation between individual segments. Now we look at the field produced by the stationary stator poles. With the excitation as shown, apply the right hand rule, this flux will be to the right and also this flux to the right. So we say the magnetic X of the stator or the excitation or the field is to the right. Now we insert between these stationary poles, we insert the armature. The armature here, I'm using a simple example, 12 slots. The slots have uh, two layers, a conductor, at the bottom of the slot and another conductor at the top of the slot. So for example, this is the conductor at the bottom of slot nine, and this is the conductor at the top of slot number 10. The end connection is not shown for all slots, but it can easily be traced by remembering that one coil side in the top of a slot is connected to a, a coil side on the bottom of another slot that is diagonally opposite. For example, slot number one, what is the diagonally opposite slot? Is slot number seven. So 
top of slot number one is connected to the bottom of slot number seven and bottom of slot number one is also connected to the top of slot number seven we delete that now similarly you can trace the end connection for any other other slot now let's see what is the magnetic field distribution due to current entering the brush this is the carbon brush which is in contact at the moment at this we just froze the rotor at this position it's rotating but we just took this snapshot so the current going in it will go to segment number one segment number one has a solid connection going upward and another solid connection going downwards we will follow the path of the current going upward so the path going upward will go to connection solid connection to the bottom conduct coil side and slot number one it's connected to the top of slot number seven out of slot number seven goes this way it reaches segment number two segment number two the current cannot move to the adjacent segments there is no brushing contact the only way it can go either up yes it can go only up actually it goes up to this coil side in the bottom of slot number two it's not shown but this coil side is connected to the slot diagonally opposite which is number eight this is the bottom so it's the top of number eight the current goes from the back end to this point then goes to the front end to segment number three segment number three the only way for the current to go is to this coil side in the bottom of slot number three which is connected to the top coil side of slot number nine goes to segment number four out of segment number four to the bottom coil side in slot number four which is connected diagonally opposite to will be top of number 10 out of top number 10 to segment number five out of segment number five to the bottom coil side in slot number five connected through the back end diagonally opposite it's number 11 and the top which goes to segment number six and then out of it to the bottom coil side in slot number six which is connected to a slot diagonally opposite which is number 12 out of this slot goes to segment number seven segment number seven now is connected to the brush and the current goes out of the machine in a similar way you can trace the current that was going down with entering the machine slot number one we trace the one that went up the current going down will also end up at segment number seven out of the machine fine so now we know that the current distribution is as shown and it's correct what does it mean you see here all the coil sides all the conductors to the right of the center line have crosses crosses means current going into the board and all the ones to the left have dots which means current out of the board so the net flux produced by this arrangement of current would be if you apply the right hand rule will be a magnetic x of the armature is pointing upwards this situation at an instant of time but the rotor is rotating and we're assuming here rotation uh, anti-clockwise as indicated so we see what happens now we will see what happens when this slot number one takes the position at the center line this is the slide we, we discussed 
This is after rotation and slot number one moved to this new position here. Now, if you remember between the two poles from the magnetic circuit, the flux density was zero. And indeed here, you can see these coils, these conductors don't have crosses or dots don't have any current. So the current here is zero in them. The other coil sides is still the ones to the right have crosses. The ones to the left has dots, which means while the field magnetomotive force is still uh, horizontal, to the right, the armature magnetomotive force is uh, still upwards. The angle between them is obviously 90 degrees. Can we, get, can we get better than that? No. Delta equals 90. The angle between the two fields equals 90 is the case which produces the maximum force and torque. Further rotation of the uh, uh, rotor and the armature in the anti-clockwise position will yield a situation very similar to this here. But here, this is going to be slot number one, and this is a slot number uh, 12, and so on. And the position, the slot number one, will move to the position now taken by number 12. So it doesn't matter. So the current in slot number one, as it moves from here, it was x, to here, it's zero, to there, it will be dot. The current in the coil will reverse, but in space, the commutator fixes the magnetic axis of the armature in one direction, which is perpendicular to that of the field. When I was studying the machine myself, I was told that the function of the commutator is to rectify the AC generated inside the DC machine to make it DC. Well, that's oversimplification because the commutator does much more than that. The commutator yields a magnetomotive force of the armature winding that is perpendicular to that of the field winding. And they give us always delta in the DC machine equals 90 degrees electrical.